Joining us today is Dr. Michael Garrett, MD. He is a professor emeritus of clinical psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the State University of New York, Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn. He is certified in psychiatry by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology and is a faculty member at the Psychoanalytic Association of New York, affiliated with NYU Longone Health. Dr. Garrett's research interests include the relationship between psychosis and ordinary mental life and psychotherapy for psychosis. He is a four-time recipient of the SUNY Downstate Distinguished Educator Award. His recent book, published in 2019, Psychotherapy for Psychosis, Integrating Cognitive, Behavioral, and Psychodynamic Treatment, um, will be the topic of our conversation today. Dr. Garrett, first of all, thank you so much for joining me today. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first, I wanted to say one of the things that stuck out to me is just that you, after many years um, post psychoanalytic treatment, I think at the time that this book was published in 2019, you said that 15 years prior you went back to school for CBT. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah just um, going back to school later, later on in this stage, I think that shows a lot um, of a, a lot of humility for one thing and a lot of your character. So I just wanted to say I thought that that was really encouraging. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> I bet it was. And can you tell us? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. But maybe first, this book, Psychotherapy for Psychosis, um, what went into this writing this book and why were you inclined to do so? Well, it relates, uh, Daniel, to what we just started to talk about, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, I began my career um, interested in psychoanalysis. I got my psychoanalytic training, mm -hmm. but I uh, worked uh, in the hospital. I didn't have an ambition to become uh, a training analyst, mm -hmm. and uh, I was interested in working with uh, more disturbed people. But I found that my psychoanalytic training uh, didn't lead to my uh, actually having a lot of successes with people. Mm. I felt it helped me to understand things, uh, but not necessarily implement in the public clinic. And then uh, about uh, 20 years ago now, I took a new job at SUNY where I became mm. the vice chairman there. And uh, when I was being um, interviewed, uh, one of the interviewers who was a schizophrenia researcher, he asked me, so what are you reading these days? Which is a very good question because it's not a good answer to say, well, I'm not really reading anything. <laughs> I'm an academic position. So I said, I'm reading this very interesting book by uh, uh, Turkington and Kingdon on CBT for psychosis. Hmm. And uh, about 20 years ago, um, there began uh, a lot of uh, interest and successful research and treatment development of cognitive behavioral therapy, which began in Great Britain uh, and, and spread to a number of different sites in Europe, and, and there are places in the U.S. that are doing it now. So um, the, uh, the very people who wrote the book, one of them uh, was coming to do a seminar at SUNY oh. Downstate <laughs> oh, wow. later in the month. So I got a new job and a new perspective on life, uh, hmm. all in one thing. So I took a, a week-long training with uh, Doug Turkington and Alison Braban, who are two senior uh, British CBT clinicians. Huh. And as we were uh, alluding before, it's tough to go back to school mm. because uh, I was uh, senior enough in my department that I'm supposed to be the professor, the one knows the answers to things, uh -huh. uh, not the student. Uh, so uh, it required stepping outside the comfort of a narrow guild affiliation to go back mm. to school. So I went back to school. I did some more reading. Uh, I uh, took supervision where I presented my cases for a year mm. on a monthly basis with a small group uh, to get the feedback from the British clinicians, pretty standard psychotherapy training. And then after that, um, I started to uh, apply what I had learned. Mm. And uh, very lucky uh, for me all around, the first patient that I really tried to apply CBT uh, techniques combined with a psycho psychoanalytic perspective, mm -hmm. she did very well. 
Oh, go ahead. Uh, so <laughs> this really works. You know, I, <laughs> this is really effective. Uh-huh. And this first patient that I worked with, uh, she was in what in New York State is called the AOT program for people who have repeat admissions. Okay. She'd been in and out of the hospital uh, three, four, five times a year for many years. She was smart. Uh, she had never had ambitious psychotherapy. And um, in uh, four months of once a week sessions, uh, she made very substantial progress. And uh, this is a, um, uh, the, the answer to this question is fairly obvious. But if I ask you, how many more times do you think she's been admitted to the hospital in the last 20 years after su- successful therapy? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> <laughs> Zero. She's never been readmitted. Hmm. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, psychotherapy for psychosis is a panacea. Uh, It doesn't help everyone, Uh but it dramatically helped her. So uh, she's had a couple of near relapses, uh, but uh, we've always been able to fend it off with Mm. uh, continued psychotherapy. Mm. So she's lived outside the hospital for 20 years, and she's had a very different life than she would have had uh, if she didn't have the support of uh, the psychotherapy. Yeah. So all of this led to when I was seeing that I was getting some actual results uh Uh and it took me a couple of years to think that i really had an idea of what i was doing or that i could understand it and then out of that came the idea of writing a book Mm. uh, to integrate cbt and psychoanalytic perspectives Mm. yeah uh the the turkington that you were reading I, i forget the other author but what year was that published uh kingdon and turkington uh Mm -hmm. i think it was uh uh, 205 they've had two books that have come out uh, and uh, I published a paper with Doug Turkington in 2011, which was the first sort of conceptualization of integrating CBT and psychodynamic work. And then that paper kind of was like a, an outline for what eventually became the book. Is that the one where you wrote about hallucinations and the, um, the continuity between hallucinations and ordinary mental life? Uh, there's a little bit of that in that paper, but that's a different paper. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and so when you got supervision, you said once a month for, I think, a year. Was that with Turkington and Kington? Uh, Allison Braban was uh, one of our main supervisors in our small group, and it was a weekly supervision. Oh, okay. And because of the time difference, uh, I remember Wednesday mornings vividly, particularly in the winter in New York, because I had to get in very early and get over to uh, Kings County Hospital to this uh, gothic, you know, psychiatric building. So we would all huddle there around our coffee at seven in the morning you know, to make the time difference work. Yeah. And uh, so once a week we presented cases, uh, had peer supervision, discussed it. Mm. Uh, and then that's how I learned about the application you know, mm. of the CBT uh-huh. techniques. And uh, something I thought that you said was interesting, I remember, so I'm very, very new, but I already kind of came into grad school thinking um, psychodynamic therapy is what I was most interested in. And then I had a supervisor, I had to switch supervisors halfway through my first year, and they were into either CBT or ACT acceptance. You wrote a little bit about yeah. how you're looking into ACT. Um, and I remember postulating the question of, well, is using different modalities or different therapies just to cover up for not knowing your own modality or your own theoretical orientation well enough and that was very i've come i think a long way since then but i I, that's why i think what one reason it stood out to me so much is i think that from from outside the psychoanalytic community reading about it there's a lot of pride there and a lot of um you know sticking to your roots and so to kind of, like you said, go back to school and to learn CBT and how that that could be, and to even to even say that that is a better, it's more applicable to patients with psychosis, um, I think is very interesting. But then in the book, you you talk about integrating the two and how CBT deals with the literal falsehood and then the psychodynamic principles deals with figurative truth. Can you talk about that to us? Sure. Um, As I mentioned before, my basic clinical identity and grounding is psychoanalytic. 
Uh, but there's a way to encompass comfortably um, CBT techniques. And uh, from a psychoanalytic point of view, we could think about CBT mm. as a skillful elaboration of the observing ego. Mm. So the observing ego is a fundamental concept in uh, psychodynamic practice. Mm. So um, it should be true in general that whatever kind of psychotherapy you practice should follow naturally from the model mm. of the condition that you're trying to help. Uh -huh. So the way I conceptualize uh, psychosis, I'm, I'm certainly not the only one that uh, sees it this way, mm -hmm. is that um, there's a very high incidence of adverse life experiences, trauma mm -hmm. in the lives of people who end up being psychotic. Mm -hmm. The numbers are very high. Uh, and uh, so if we start with the idea that uh, many people have been traumatized, mm -hmm. a, a real bad thing has happened to them mm. in real life. But by the time they get to adolescence or young adulthood, um, the, the, the residue of this traumatic experience from childhood, uh, it becomes projected outward so that uh, it is depicted in the form of a relationship with a persecutor that's mm. viewed as being in the outside world. So instead of a person remembering uh, that they are being that they were uh, raped, for example, mm -hmm. sexually abused, they don't remember that because they're focused on uh, a battle with the persecutor mm -hmm. where they think a neighbor or the devil or a voice or somebody mm -hmm. uh, is trying to do them harm. Mm -hmm. So the harm that was actually done to them becomes represented uh, as a problem in the real world. Mm -hmm. Now, that's where I think CBT technique is particularly useful. Because as long as the person is preoccupied uh, with the problem in the real world, um, they're not focused on their internal psychology or the events that happened to them when they were growing up. Uh, an example of this, which is in the 2011 paper I mentioned, is uh, we had a man in the hospital who uh, blamed himself for uh, his younger brother's death because he was going to lead his family out of uh, poverty. Uh, and his brother got involved in a gang and was killed in a gang-related slaying. Mm. Uh, so he hated himself uh, for this. Uh, and he spiraled downward in depression, alcoholism, and chronic psychosis. And his mother brought him to the hospital, finally, because he uh, had essentially stopped eating. And in the hospital, he said uh, he wasn't going out of his room and certainly wasn't leaving his apartment building because there was a dog that was on the block that had x-ray vision that could look through his clothing. Uh, and whenever he would see this dog, he would think that the dog was mocking uh, him, uh, mm. looking uh, and being derisive about his puny, pathetic, unmasculine body. So what's happening here is that the patient has become, he's forgotten his brother because he's, he's preoccupied with the dog. Uh -huh. The dog is his problem. The dog is a persecutor in the outside world. So one can use CBT techniques to raise gentle questions about mm. the dog. So th things like one wouldn't do this uh, all at once or so quickly, but uh, this dog, you know, has the dog been on the block for a long time? Yes, he has. Uh, well, did the dog always look at you in this way? Well, no. I mean, there were years when he just looked at me and I, he didn't have x-ray vision. Oh, that's interesting. So this is a new thing. Uh, mm. I see. And the other dogs look at you this way. Well, I haven't noticed. Well, that dog, does he look at other people in the same way? Uh, uh, I, I never noticed that. Well, can you tell me what's an ordinary look from a dog and the look of this dog? How do they differ? Mm. Uh, how could I tell whether the dog was looking like that? Yeah, so all yeah. of that is CBT work focused on the conscious experience of the eruption of the symptom. Mm. And if you're successful using CBT techniques and raising some doubts about whether the dog really has x-ray vision, then you can begin uh, uh, an opening out into a psychodynamic way of working. What other explanation could there be for this? Uh, and then that leads to the dog as a projection of his self-hatred. Mm -hmm. And most psychodynamic clinicians, I think, would know probably in five or 10 minutes that this dog is a projection of poor self-esteem, mm -hmm. that this is a fragment of a superego. That's pretty obvious. Uh -huh. But it's not obvious how to work with it. It's uh -huh. not obvious how to approach this in psychotherapy. Uh -huh. So that's, that's why I think the combination of CBT uh -huh. uh, actually makes sense in dealing with psychotic uh, people. 
And it's not a situation where um, uh, all contestants win prizes, mm. like <laughs> where uh, everybody gets an award. Yeah. You know? No, no, that, not everybody gets an award. But but these two things have value when mm. when used in the, together in this particular way. Yeah, um, and in your book, at the, at the beginning, you you made clear that you know you're not inventing a new type of therapy for psychosis you're just taking kind of like two puzzle pieces and putting them together to and integrating the two right yes yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. um and so when you were talking about with cbt so you hear you hear like maybe the term reality testing thrown around a lot but I i think a lot of people don't really know for sure it's kind of like saying um, you know, stabilize the client. And they're like, well, what does that mean? How do I do that? So when you're talking about with the asking the client about the dog, like, oh, how does it look at you? How do you know that that's what it's doing? If it, how does it differ from how it looks at other people? Would you say that that's a form of reality testing? Yes. Um, and uh, the name for it in CBT technique uh, is peripheral questioning. Okay. And what you're doing is uh, the psychotic idea exists kind of cordoned off in a split off dissociated space mm. where, where, where the dog is a uh, psychological object. It's uh-huh. not, uh, there's a real dog there. There was a real dog in his neighborhood, but not mm-hmm. the dog in his mind. Mm-hmm. So the technique of peripheral questioning is that you're inquiring about the perceptual details mm. of the experience. And that grounds the experience. It connects it to um, uh, a uh, consensual reality. Uh-huh. And this alone uh, sometimes uh, weakens the conviction that the person has uh-huh. because they haven't made an account of the entire consensual reality that applies. They're not even interested in that question. And then when they're invited to think about this, mm. doubts begin to arise. Well, you know, maybe... Uh, that doesn't quite make sense. Uh, and uh, the person's own doubts, you know, start to come to the, the fore. Uh-huh. And then you're off and running, you know, with uh, some traction for psychotherapy. Mm. Yeah. You talk about how, so after that, um, you kind of lead off with CBT techniques. You get maybe once doubts start to arise and then you get the patient to realize that, um, okay, if it's not really in the dog, well, what's the explanation for this? And once their ability to do that shows up, that's when you switch or you you transition kind of a, from a CBT phase to a more of a psychodynamic phase. And throughout treatment, you kind of shift back and forth. Is that correct? Can you kind of talk about that? Yes. Uh, and uh, as I think is, is, is obvious, I'm not talking about a strict CBT phase that's over. Okay. And then you go to phase two. Okay. But it's a question of the relative emphasis of techniques. Mm. So there are times uh, where um, uh, the, some psychodynamic work needs to be done very quickly, very early on to even mm. establish a relationship you know, with the patient. Oh. Oh. Uh, but So this is a, a kind of a broad view on average of an emphasis of uh, different techniques. Mm. And um, you can use... Uh, a psychodynamic understanding uh, in the application of Mm. CBT techniques. Um, I wrote a paper recently with uh, a um, second chance schizophrenia program uh, at uh, Cornell Westchester in New York. Uh, The paper is about resistances to the use of logic Mm. in CBT. Mm. So CBT uh, relies significantly on uh, the array of evidence, uh, thinking logically about one situation. Does the dog really have x-ray vision? That kind of thing. And people have psychological resistances to using logic, to seeing the implications of logic. So that's a way that your uh, psychodynamic listening ear uh, mm. is present throughout the whole treatment. And it's also the case that even if you've had a successful treatment, um, the patient can sometimes have Uh, relapses in the future uh, because something's happened in their life, Mm. which is stirring up, you know, an old conflict. And there, what's called CBT booster sessions can be very helpful, even if you've had a significant period of psychodynamic work. Mm. 
hmm. where you put the uh, new idea uh, in context with the old idea. You put it on the CBT workbench. Uh, and uh, I've had very good luck over the years uh, in not having to hospitalize people and also not having to chase the symptom by uh, polypharmacy or increasing doses. Uh, you give the person uh, a couple of doses of CBT booster sessions where the person recalls the work that you did in the past. Mm. Uh, and uh, that can be very stabilizing for people. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I, I wanted to point out, so you, you begin the book um, with a line and you say, or you write, patients and clinicians who often accept stability rather than aim for substantial recovery in work and interpersonal relationships. Um, I see this, I think, even in outpatient treatment. I was wondering if you can kind of talk about your experience with this and with patients with psychosis. Yeah, there are, there are complicated historical origins to our current situation. And um, so it depends where you want to pick up the history. But if we pick up the history in the mid-1950s, uh -huh. uh, at that time, most of the chairmen of academic psychiatric departments in the United States were psychoanalysts. Mm. Uh, today, almost none are. Uh. They're all biological psychiatrists. But in the okay. 1950s, that was kind of a heyday of psychoanalysis. But then there was the advent of Thorazine. Uh, a neuroleptic uh, which had uh, a um, dramatic effect in some patients on acute symptoms primarily. Mm. So um, this led to a dramatic shift uh, away from psychotherapy toward biological treatments. Mm. And uh, I personally believe that the best uh, approach is a combination of uh, the minimum amount of medication that a person needs or no medication, if you can get away with that, and mm. psychotherapy. Uh, but uh, because psychoanalysis sort of oversold its mandate uh -huh. uh, and, and they claimed too much, uh -huh. uh, as Thorazine was ascending, the psychoanalytic uh, star was descending. Mm. Uh, and then we end up with um, uh, the last 50 years dominated by biological approaches to psychiatry. Mm. So that creates an atmosphere of... Uh, pessimism in the end, hmm. because uh, there's solid research evidence that about uh, only about one in seven people really have a substantial recovery from psychosis. Okay. The prognosis is not good. Uh -huh. uh, and if you have uh, a, a biological approach to it, uh, uh -huh. the natural thought is, well, people aren't getting better because we haven't discovered the biological cause yet. Mm. So when we discover better biological treatments, you know, treatment will improve. Mm -hmm. And if you don't really expect psychotic people to get better, uh, then you never ask the question, well, could it be that we already have techniques that could help people, but we're just not using them? Mm. So this question never gets asked. And the lack of results, the lack of recovery becomes rationalized and blamed on the illness mm. rather than the inadequacy of the treatment. And uh, it was interesting to me, uh, there was an interview done with Thomas Insel, who uh, used to be the director of uh, NIMH, uh, which funnels money for research, you know, for psychosis and other things. Uh, and uh, he stated that, you know, uh, despite the fact of billions of dollars you know, being funneled into neuroscience research, as he put it, uh, it didn't move the needle at all. Mm. Uh, in terms of uh, frontline applicable techniques. Uh -huh. And this idea has been uh, supported by um, a number of um, uh, review articles by uh, senior neuroscientists, sort of the, the, um, uh, the highlights of the field, uh, who come to the same conclusion, uh, that nothing of uh, significant uh, applicability in the treatment on the front lines has come through Wow. since the advent of uh, Thorazine. Hmm. And there have been some changes, some improvements, uh, and uh, definitely we're better off uh, having the biological treatments that we have available. Mm -hmm. uh, but compared with other branches of medicine, which have made dramatic inroads, uh, psychiatry is lagging behind. And because it's hard to get funding to do research uh, with a 15-year you know, follow-up gap, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, people like to do research that can be completed in a couple of months uh, <laughs> because that's what agencies will fund. Yeah. But the long-term outcomes suggest uh, that people who um, uh, taper themselves off their neuroleptics mm -hmm. and who have the lowest exposure to neuroleptic medications in the long run uh, actually have more functional outcomes than people mm -hmm. who are on medication. Mm -hmm. So this is a contradiction to the universal pessimism about uh, psychosis. People get better. Hmm. Not everybody, but people get better. Uh, and uh, this should be our uh, guiding star, you know, rather than uh, this kind of pervasive pessimism uh, that leads people to think, well, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's just the illness. We have to wait for the biological cure to come. Mm -hmm. And so with that mentality that it's just an illness and we have to wait for the biological cure to come, um, with what you're trying to kind of get you know, get, what you're trying to kind of give momentum to is what you, what you call an, an ambitious form of psychotherapy for psychosis has other outside of yourself. How much do you see psychotherapy for psychosis being done or how much of it is really just waiting around and giving out neuroleptics and waiting for maybe a new biological cure? Um, also, for complicated financial and political reasons, uh -huh. um, treatment as usual in the United States and most places in the world is biologically based. Uh, it's much cheaper, much easier mm. uh, to give patients medication than uh -huh. to train psychotherapists and provide psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. So part of this depends upon uh, uh, the will of the citizens. Uh, and in every society, there's a fundamental question. Uh, how much do we owe our fellow man? Mm. Uh, how much are we going to give to the disabled? And if you follow politics in the United States, um, this is a, uh, a generalization that reflects my own politics. But I think uh, on average, uh, the Democratic Party in the United States believes uh, that some resources should be given mm. to um, the disabled uh, and the less fortunate. Uh -huh. uh, and I think the Republican Party believes more in uh, self-initiative, mm. uh, no handouts from the government. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, a, a lot of what, you know, the, the question of what's available for the treatment of psychosis depends upon si uh, society's priorities and what they're willing to give. Mm. And unfortunately, the stigma uh, of mental illness, severe mental illness, which is not correct, it's not true, is that um, psychotic people can be uh, violent or lazy. Those, mm. These are two you know, stigmatizing ideas. And it's not funny, but you, you have much better chance of being murdered by your husband or your wife mm. than you have <laughs> being harmed <laughs> by a psychotic person. Uh -huh. uh, but that's not the uh, stigmatizing attitude toward psychosis. So are these people deserving of... Uh, uh, tax dollars and the community effort. I certainly think so. Mm. Uh, but uh, that's not a decision that clinicians can make in the latter. And we have to work within whatever society provides. Mm -hmm. So having said that, I think that each clinician has to do their part mm -hmm. within uh, the limited resources that we have. Uh, there have been estimates um, that we have about 0.5% of uh, what's needed in terms of trained clinicians. 0.5%. Like 0.5%. Wow. Right? And we know that uh, if on a national basis, if we had 0.5% of the medical capacity to take care of people with heart attacks, <laughs> that wouldn't stand. No. That would be over. Uh -huh. That would be over in a year. Money would, uh, you know, rush, you know, to mm. that problem. But it doesn't rush to the problem of, chronically mentally ill. So uh, there's a lot of resources are missing. So we do what we can. So what am I doing? Uh, I'm doing this interview with you. I wrote a book. Uh, I'm working on a second book. Um, I supervise in uh, first episode teams. I try to get the word out. I try to inject this way of thinking into psychiatric residency training. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a variety of fronts. Um, where uh, we have to keep 
this perspective alive? And mm -hmm. I don't know because I can't control it. And I don't think anybody can predict it. Uh, when will the day come yeah. when uh, society as a large wants to devote more uh, to the care of its uh, less fortunate? And um, <laughs> you want to hear a delusional fantasy? <laughs> my part. So here's a delusion. Okay. The delusion is that climate change will require a radical democratization of society. Uh -huh. uh, we can't solve the problem of climate change uh -huh. uh, with the income disparities that we have now. And out of that will come uh, a more local communal sense. Uh, and part of that will be uh, a deeper sense of caring you know, for one's uh, uh, fellow men and women, uh, and uh, that in that new sense of community, uh, maybe there'll be uh, more allocation of resources. But I say that's probably a delusion. Uh, um, and okay, so one, I think it'll be exciting for me being brand new and coming into the field to see how this shifts over time. And I hope to see that all of the work that you're doing and um, all of this effort that you're putting in, I hope to see it on the back end. I hope to see it really swing around. It sounds like the pendulum in the early days was all for psychoanalysis and therapy. And then the pendulum has swung to biological and you're trying to get the pendulum kind of somewhere in the middle. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, another quote that you, you mentioned in your book is you, you wrote that some patients who are adherent to their medication report that neuroleptics numb their feelings which may help people tolerate their delusional beliefs without fundamentally changing them. And so one, um, one that's, it's very apparent to me how that is. I just, I don't like that kind of band-aid solution, I guess, if I don't want someone to have to live with a delusion that has never been changed, but they're just able to live with it. Um, but also, it, it's implying that with psychotherapy, you can change uh, delusional belief. And can you speak to changing delusions? And also for someone who's experiencing maybe mostly hallucinations, um, can hallucinations be changed also? Mm -hmm. uh, as I'm sure won't surprise you, um, the uh, outcomes for people are highly varied along a continuum. Mm. So uh, at one extreme, uh, there are people who have a single psychotic episode. Uh -huh. uh, they um, are briefly treated with neuroleptic medications. They never have another. Hmm. Uh, and there's no residual of delusions or hallucinations. So there are folks like that. Yeah. Um, then there are people who get some uh, benefit from uh, medication, but they have residual symptoms. Uh, and uh, this is more common. Hmm. And um, the, uh, in my experience, and I think what the literature uh, reflects is that um, there's no question that psychotherapy can help people change their attitudes mm. toward their psychotic experiences uh -huh. so that these experiences can become less distressing. Okay. And that's part of the acceptance and commitment therapy approach. Uh -huh. uh, it's also part of, it's a classic part of uh, CBT approach. Uh, even if you can't eliminate the experience itself, you can change the person's attitude toward that mm. experience. Mm. Uh, in my work, um, I certainly have uh, experienced that, that, that you can help people change their attitudes. Um, occasionally, not so often, occasionally, uh, I've seen an actual decrease in the frequency of auditory hallucinations uh, okay. as a result of psychotherapy, not medication, but as a uh -huh. result of psychotherapy. Uh, but uh, more commonly, um, the uh, I think the delusional ideas are probably a little more amenable to psychotherapy in general, mm. uh, and uh, that one can uh, have have uh, good gains and changes in the person's belief. Mm. Uh, the hallucinatory experience may be a little less accessible. Okay. Uh, in terms of psychotherapy. Uh -huh. uh, and then there are uh, some folks uh, who uh, develop an adaptation to their voices uh, without any medication at all. And uh, some of the leaders of the uh, voice hearing network 
uh, that began in Great Britain uh, and now has chapters you know, all over the world. Uh, I'll uh, tell you a story about one of the leaders of that organization. Uh, she was uh, abused as a child uh, mm. and heard voices, uh, tapered herself off medication, uh, but continued to hear voices. Mm. Uh, but she had uh, adapted a different relationship with the voices. So she's very smart, excellent speaker. So I went to a um, talk that she was giving mm -hmm. in a small library. So she, she's getting her computer ready to give the talk. Uh -huh. uh, and she's having trouble with the, um, the IT, you know, getting the sound up and everything like that. So then you saw for a moment her face was frozen mm -hmm. and she knew it. So she said to the audience, uh, I bet some of you are, are wondering, did I just hear a voice? Mm. Uh, and she said, yes, I did hear a voice. And you know what the voice said? The voice said, you've never been any damn good at the electronics. <laughs> so she just with the grace of a dancer, you uh -huh. know, she, uh -huh. she just, uh, you know, uh, wow. handled mm. that experience uh, with a kind of ironic, you know, sort of funny way. And she went on and gave a, you know, a great talk. Yeah. So that's an enormous gain, you know, for a person uh, yeah. to have uh, that kind of attitude and, and change relationship with the voices, as opposed to a voice that uh, is deathly serious uh, and mm. has horrible implications for the uh, the person. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, and so I think that's a good point. Is in in the book you talked about how it's not necessarily a lessening of the hallucinations or or even perhaps, I might get this wrong. You can please correct me if I do. But it's not necessarily lessening the hallucinations or delusions, but when you have a client or patient, it's what is most distressing and, and lessening that. And oftentimes it is that the delusion, what, what accompanies the delusion is what is most distressing. So you tackle the delusion in that way. Is that correct? Or how far I'm off am I? Yes, but as I said before, um, uh -huh. it can be highly varied depending upon the individual. Uh -huh. So, for example, uh, I'm working with a patient now uh, who uh, hears critical voices oh. uh, coming through the wall. Hmm. And uh, the conversation that we're developing, this is a person who uh, can recognize hmm. uh, profound self-doubts about themselves that they've okay. had since they were a kid. Uh -huh. uh, so the conversation that we're working on is that uh, he now has uh, a, a particular way of experiencing his uh -huh. self-doubts. So other people might experience self-doubts uh, in a ruminative thought, but he experiences his own self-doubt in the form of uh, a projected voice. Mm. So that is an example of a technique in CBT that we call normalizing, which means it's not that being psychotic is normal in the general sense of the word, but that it has connections to ordinary mental life. And uh, people experience uh, the world in somewhat different ways. So mm. you can say, oh, the way you experience your, your uh, doubts is in an auditory form. That, uh. that, that's the way you think. You, you think in a multimedia fashion, you think negatively about yourself in that way. Hmm. And uh, keeping it real to illustrate this, uh, we, we don't need to do it in the interview here, but if you ask a group of people to close their eyes and visualize the numbers from one to 10, hmm. uh, and then have people open their eyes, uh, in general, about 80% of the group will have heard the numbers. Interesting. And 20% will have seen the numbers. Huh. So uh, the idea here is, is that we experience our self-doubts in different media forms. So people that hear voices, uh, they experience their self-doubts in an auditory format. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, that's helpful, that makes sense. Um, can, you talk, can you explain uh, psychic equivalence? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Because uh, uh, psychoanalysis and the social disciplines, psychological disciplines, we, we rely on words to describe concepts rather than mathematical formulas, hmm. uh, there can be a lot of repetition and overlap uh, and uh, the rediscovery of things that were known before. 
in some form. It's kind of, you know, um, old wine and new bottles, that kind mm. of thing. Uh -huh. uh, and that's not all bad because uh, when people rediscover the same thing, it lends some credibility to it. So mm. Melanie Klein, for example, uh, in the 1930s was writing about what she called uh, the paranoid schizoid position and the depressive position. And in the paranoid schizoid position, which is the early psychological state in life, which she inferred from working with uh, young children, uh, is that uh, mental representations of other people in the world are largely projections of the child's inner world. So in this sense, uh, the world as seen through the eyes of a child is equivalent to their own experience. Mm. That's psychic equivalence. And, okay. and um, uh, Peter Fonagy and um, Fonny and Target have uh, uh, done research to, to rename this psychic equivalence. That's their name for Klein's uh, uh, paranoid schizoid position. The uh -huh. concepts aren't exactly the same, but they're very similar. Uh -huh. So what does that mean? Uh, when you have a two-year-old, uh, they don't have the idea that they can lie Two-year-olds think that, for the most part, their mothers can read their minds, and, and they can't be that secretive. Mm. They don't have the grasp that different people have different subjectivities, mm. and that different people would see the world in different ways, because psychic equivalence, they think that the world is as they experience it, is mm. as they see it. There's no boundary to the subjectivity of the self. You get a four-year-old uh, who makes the wonderful discovery, no, you can actually lie to your mother. <laughs> You can say your brother did it, uh -huh. and your mother can't read your mind. And that's the establishment of the boundary uh, between one's own subjectivity and the subjectivity of another person. Mm -hmm. And then that opens out into um, Klein's depressive position, which is the idea uh, of uh, understanding that uh, people are different from ourselves. They have uh, different internal worlds, uh, and that because they are different, uh, they're precious, and that's why the uh, depressive position comes in, because uh, if something is just your own solipsistic projection, mm. if it's just a character in your own story, there's no loss in uh, the death of that person mm. or the elimination of that person. But if there's a real person that's different than you, that's outside you, uh -huh. that creates the possibilities for uh, loss, grief, mm. reparation. Uh, guilt, uh, all these other uh, nuances of feeling that you don't have if, you, if you're living in a world of your own creation. That makes sense. And so in, in your book, you talk, so you mentioned three different kind of pathways to, um, let's just say, psychosis. And one of them is kind of losing a sense of self. And so when you lose your sense of self, then the psychic equivalence that a child experiences, let's say, is kind of equal to uh, the psychic equivalence that maybe a psychotic person might have? Yes, there's an overlap. Uh, uh -huh. And one has to be careful uh, to say uh, normal children, ordinary children are not psychotic. It's mm -hmm. a mystery application. They're kids. They think all kinds of crazy stuff like <laughs> belief in Santa Claus. And, uh, you know, that, that's a strange idea. You know? Imaginary like, friends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, kids are kids and they have a particular way of thinking about the world. And, and it's, it's not right to say they're psychotic. Uh -huh. Psychotic adults have a way of thinking about the world that regresses to um, childlike forms of the experience mm. of the world. But that doesn't mean that uh, psychotic adults are childish hmm. uh, in, in some kind of demeaning way. Uh -huh. And psychic equivalence is an example of this, so that uh, it's a very common uh, psychotic symptom, very common, hmm. uh, that people think that uh, their minds can be read, hmm. uh, that their thoughts are known. Uh -huh. uh, and this is the idea that the world out there is hooked in. Hmm. There is no boundary to one's subjectivity. There's no privacy. Uh -huh. So that's the mind of a two-year-old that thinks that uh, their mother can read their mind mm. uh, in a more malignant uh, context. And it's terrible for an adult to imagine uh, that their minds are open uh, and that their thoughts can be read because we all have thoughts that we don't want to be publicly known, uh, you know, in the course of the day. Uh -huh. 
Yeah. And uh, this also relates to um, disturbances in self-experience because uh, as the robust feeling of the I at the center of attention mm. diminishes and the person becomes an observer uh, to themselves, uh, in this weakened state of subjectivity, in this more two-dimensional state of subjectivity, mm-hmm. there's less of a feeling that, that I am thinking my own thoughts. Mm-hmm. I am a separate person in my own right. And under those circumstances, when a person thinks a thought and doesn't feel like it used to, mm-hmm. a natural conclusion is, I'm not thinking this thought. It doesn't feel like I'm thinking this thought. Mm-hmm. Somebody must be putting it into my head. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, that is this world of psychic equivalence where the world is as I imagine it to be. Mm. There's no sense of uh, a difference between the investment of fantasy in something and the actuality in the outside world. Mm. That explains a lot. And it explains uh, about like, you know, paranoid schizophrenia. Like that's something that you hear coupled together. And um, and in your book, you mentioned a young woman who thought that a computer chip had been implanted into her mind. Um, I, that's a, a very common, like you said, I, I, I don't work with this, but I hear a lot about it. And, um, and, or like the FBI is watching me or they've bugged my room or something like that. So it makes a lot of sense when it comes to psychic equivalence. And I, I found it fascinating. Um, just you, you kind of drew a parallel to children avoiding a crack in order to not break their mother's back. Can you just briefly explain, explain that to someone who maybe hasn't put that together? Yeah, we, we all have uh, islands of superstition. Hmm. Uh, most people do. Uh, oh. Little things. Uh, so uh, in medical school, for example, many people, uh, or you know, where, where you're taking uh, tests that you have to pass, uh, significant tests. Many people have test-taking rituals where they wear the same sweatshirt or they take mm-hmm. the same pen or they have some magical preparation. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Harry Potter is all about magical rituals, controlling mm-hmm. persecutory objects with magical rituals. Mm-hmm. So superstition runs through um, the uh, adult minds mm-hmm. uh, and we all have some islands of superstition and magical thinking. and. Um, Everybody kind of understands implicitly the idea of step on a crack and break your mother's back. Mm. And the reason that that's about psychic equivalence is that uh, that's a statement of a person who thinks that their thoughts can kill. Mm. And the way it works is uh, the child uh, is frightened uh, of having angry thoughts about their mother Mm. uh, because they need their mother. They need the good mother, uh, and they don't want to be angry at their mother. Mm. But the child, nevertheless, is angry and has destructive impulses toward the mother. Mm. So step on a crack and break your mother's. uh, It's a perfect opportunity. Mm. Don't step on a crack, and you save your mother (laughs) from your own aggression. Because it's embedded in the magical uh, ritual. And in that case, the fears that the child has of their most, their own aggressive impulses becomes projected outwards Mm. into the sidewalk. So Uh the sidewalk is actually part of the person's mind. Uh It's a regulatory influence. The lines in the sidewalk uh, are uh, safety measures. And if you avoid those lines, you'll keep your mother safe. Yeah. So if you ask the question, so who's your mother in danger from? (laughs) (laughs) Who's going to break your mother's back? Uh Uh-huh. You, uh-huh. it's the child. And, and who's going to save your mother? Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. I, yeah, when I read that, it's it was so very it was very cool to put it all together like that. Um. So another question I had is you you briefly alluded to this earlier, but um, the how maybe a psychotic patient might take up a delusional identity, let's say with God, um, or with with the devil, and or a genius. Um, and in writing about taking up a delusional identity with maybe God or with a genius, you write that a, the psychotic patient trades the pain that comes with associative meanings for the practical problems that are created by assuming a delusional identity. Um, and so in this sense, 
how does identifying with the devil help? Like, how is that kind of a defensive mechanism to, to identify with the devil? Um, if we go back to the example I was telling you about before of, of the man who experiences the dog with the x-ray vision, uh -huh. um, in that instance, uh, the, uh, the dog is a kind of devil in mm. his uh, he, he didn't say that the dog was the embodiment of the devil, mm -hmm. but another patient might mm -hmm. say that the dog is visiting is the devil is visiting him in the form of the dog. Uh -huh. But what's happening there is that um, the person's the particulars of the person's painful life, uh -huh. the death of his brother, disappear, uh, and the new problem dominates his thinking, which mm -hmm. is the problem of the dog. So what often happens in psychosis is that the, um, uh, the, the, ground, the grounded, down-to-earth, painful biography, the particulars of the person's life, get lost in a kind of mythic uh, uh, narrative of mm. the person's life. So if one is the devil, mythically, mm -hmm. uh, you're not thinking about uh, your mother, father, sister, or brother, you're not thinking about your own capacity for uh, being unkind. Mm. You're not thinking about uh, the people that have hurt you or your wish to hurt them, mm -hmm. you know, in uh, return. Uh, no, you've become a mythic figure. So you are the devil. Mm. Uh, so the particulars of your life have been lost. And uh, uh, I mean, I don't expect you to know this, but... Uh -huh. Is the devil worried about being the devil? <laughs> uh -huh, I see. No, yeah. no. The, the devil doesn't lose any self-esteem. That's what the devil does. The devil uh -huh. is the devil. Uh -huh. So the, the devil isn't guilty about his ministrations. He goes about his mm -hmm. work during the day. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so if you can get inside the devil and be the devil figure, uh -huh. something of your personal pain is lost. And it's similar to uh, a story that, Many people uh, would know it's a fable uh, about uh, the scorpion and the frog. I don't know if you know that one, but no, please tell. scorpion uh, who can't swim comes to the side of a stream and there's a frog that lives there. Uh, and the scorpion says, please, please, I need to get across to the other side. Uh, can you give me a ride across on your back? Mm. So at first, the frog is suspicious uh, because this is scorpion. You know, it uh -huh. could sting you. Uh, and the frog is reluctant, but the scorpion persists. You know, I have to get over to this. Night. Help me out. You know, can you do this? So uh, the frog ferries the scorpion across to the other side, and just as they're getting to the shore where the scorpion is uh, safe, the scorpion stings the frog. Mm. Okay? And the frog says, why? Why did you do this? Why did you do this? And the scorpion's answer is, it's my nature. Hmm. It's my nature. Uh -huh. So when you become the devil, it's your nature uh, uh -huh. to be devilish. Uh, and all of the, the guilt-inducing complexities of life are lost in the mythic story uh, mm. of uh, the activities of the devil. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, is that, just out of curiosity, is that story, is that one of Aesop's fables or is that, no? You know, I don't know if it's Aesop, uh -huh. but um, could be. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think of scorpions as more in the American Southwest, but uh, true, maybe yeah. there are other versions of the story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, beware the scorpions' nature. They can't mm. do otherwise. So. Yeah, yeah, it makes um, identifying with the devil when you started talking about how it takes all of the personal aspects of it away. It, I had a very vivid image of just gaining gaining distance um and it just yeah it just kind of clicks so thank you um and so yeah i like i like to read um some of young's work and he talks a lot about symbols and he even talked about you know you might have someone who says you know they say i can't stomach it well it's something or i can't i can't swallow my food okay, there's something that you just can't, you can't stomach. And that's like a, it's a, almost like your body is reacting in a symbolic way. Um, and so you talk about how psychotic symptoms can be thought of as symbols. Can you 
allude. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, sure. Um, I can give you a case example. Okay. Um, a man I um, worked with uh, some years ago uh, who had a very uh, good outcome in his psychotherapy. Uh -huh. uh, he had been chronically psychotic for eight years and on medication before he came to psychotherapy. Hmm. And his central delusion was that every day when he went to work, he believed he was going to be arrested. Hmm. So he never knew uh, whether he would come home at night to his family or he's going to go to prison. Uh -huh. So this had gone on for many years uh, with no change. So uh, here's the backstory. Uh, uh, he was sexually and physically abused as a boy. Mm. Uh, and uh, when he would come home at night, his family was in such chaos and his parents were constantly fighting. Mm. Uh, he didn't know always where he was going to spend the night. Uh, mm. He would have to, um, maybe he'd go to his uncles, maybe he would go to his aunts, or maybe he would stay with his mother. So there's a lot of uncertainty and chaos. He had really had no sense of a secure home. Mm -hmm. So um, when he uh, graduated from high school, uh, he wanted to have a very different family life than he had had himself. Mm -hmm. He married early to a wonderful woman, uh, but his father, who was a narcissistic man, was teasing him, you married too early. Mm -hmm. You didn't have enough sexual experience. You know, you, you should have waited. Wow. So he felt humiliated by this and he wanted to prove himself to his father. So he had an affair, mm. which was a disaster because he couldn't keep it secret from mm. his wife. He told yeah. his wife and it almost destroyed his marriage. Mm. So he felt very guilty about that. Uh, and then this is what happened. <sighs> the reason he's going to be arrested, uh, he came to the conclusion is that in his work, uh, he uh, worked for the post office. He would distribute bulk mailing sometimes. Okay. So in New York City, uh, there may be uh, a group of phone books that would be delivered uh, in a bulk uh, tied up package hmm. where the phone books have the individual names of people who live in the building. Uh -huh. But in New York, when you get your phone book, you just pick up a copy of the phone book. You don't have to have one with your name on it. It's uh -huh. just the phone book. So he thought that the reason he was going to be arrested and taken to jail is because he did what a supervisor said, which is don't worry about delivering it to each individual address. Mm. Just take the package in and leave it in the lobby and people will pick up their own phone books. Mm. So he felt that this was his crime and this is why he was going to be arrested. Interesting. So uh, where are the symbols here? Uh, that petty infraction uh, meaningless infraction of a bureaucratic rule hmm. uh, becomes a kind of plea bargain in his mind. And he, that symbolizes his sense of being a bad person and that he's going to be punished. Hmm. The next layer of it, the real crime was the affair, hmm. but the even deeper crime was his, his only his existence. And as a little boy, he couldn't figure out why does my mother treat me this way? Hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, he couldn't uh, actually figure out uh, what would prompt her to be violent at times mm. with him. Uh, so he developed a sense uh, of uh, being a, a very, very bad person for reasons that he couldn't understand, somebody who deserved to be in prison. Uh -huh. So when you put the whole thing together, uh, and with a psychodynamic listening ear, uh, when he says, when I go to jail, when I, when I go to work, and I think I'm going to jail, and I don't know if I'm coming home that night, and then in a completely different context, in the psychotherapy, he says, as a little boy, when mm. I would come home from school, I didn't know whether I was going to stay with my mother. Or... It's the same thing. Yeah. It's the same thing. Uh -huh. It's a symbol. It's, uh -huh. it's a, the representation of the past and some concern in the present. So by understanding uh, how one thing stands in for another, by thinking symbolically about mm. it, um, you can make a uh, deeper impact in the psychotherapy. So with this man, I use CBT techniques to convince okay. him that he wasn't actually going to jail. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so once we had raised some doubts about that, he could then begin thinking about his abuse. And he actually had a conversation with his mother oh. uh, eventually about this. He felt strong enough to do this. And uh, fortunately, she said, uh, you're right, you're right. It wasn't what it should have been. We had a lot of problems, your father and I, you know, when you were growing up. 
so he was able to uh, bring this back into his uh, uh, real world relationships. And uh, as a result of the therapy, um, he no longer thought that he was going to be arrested. Uh, but I want to make clear that uh -huh. these gains, even though they can be uh, dramatic in psychotherapy, people remain vulnerable. So life goes on, new stresses come in, mm. and people tend to uh, revive their delusional ideas in response to uh, new stresses in life. Mm. So this is not like taking an antibiotic and being cured of something. The vulnerability mm. remains and people uh, can benefit from uh, long-standing relationships with therapists. Hmm. For him, um, did he ever take neuroleptics, do you know? He did, yeah. Okay. He was on neuroleptics for eight years, and it didn't really, uh, including clozapine, which is one of the more effective ones that we have, uh, hmm. and um, uh, it didn't really uh, turn the situation around. Hmm. And then when you, when, when he kind of, I don't know. Uh, in my head, I would imagine that you connected the kind of, okay, so now with now you're wondering if you're going to go to jail and not be able to go home at night. And how does that relate to when you were a child and you didn't know where you're going to end up? When you kind of connected that, was that, was that a big moment for him? Or was it still, was it kind of a, a hard pressed thing to move forward with? Does that make sense? Um, here too, uh, the situation is uh, quite variable, so uh -huh. that as a clinician, uh -huh. uh, I may have moments of insight in the therapy where I'm saying to myself with some clarity, oh, that's where that comes from. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't sure, you know, where he's going to go when it comes. It's the same thing. So uh -huh. I will have a moment of clarity about that. But uh, the the patient's experience sometimes is like that. It has that kind of lucidity, but at other times uh, it's, it's not quite that focused. It's a more kind of slower fading into mental mm. health mm -hmm. where the preoccupation with the delusion diminishes. Uh -huh. uh, and it isn't necessarily like a moment of insight where the uh, light bulb goes off in your uh -huh. head. And for this man, uh, yeah. it, it, it was like that. Uh -huh. where uh, he got sufficient doubt from the CBT techniques that this was actually happening, uh, that he could then bear to tell me about what had happened to him when mm. he was a kid. Uh, and it, it was the telling of the story of his abuse and my listening mm. and not rejecting him uh -huh. uh, and bearing witness to his suffering uh -huh. uh, that had, a, uh, I think, a powerful uh, therapeutic effect Mm. Uh, it wasn't just uh, an intellectual understanding of his circumstances. Uh -huh. Okay. I think um, earlier you were mentioning you, I think you alluded to Ariel, which in, in the book. So from my understanding, she was around 20 um, when she first had her, when she had her first psychotic kind of break episode. And then for the next 10 years, she went untreated whatsoever and then for the next 10 years, she was on neuroleptics. And then that's when you started seeing her. Um, can you talk about her and her story and her treatment? Yeah. yeah. Um, as you mentioned, uh, she's an extended case history in my book. Uh -huh. And um, she was in the public clinic uh, f uh, for 10 years on neuroleptics. And then about uh, two years before I started working with her, uh, one of the other psychiatrists there tapered off her medicine because it wasn't really helping her. So mm. we started the therapy. She was taking a small dose of an antidepressant, but okay. no neuroleptics. Mm -hmm. And um, she was smart, determined. Uh, she had done some reading about CBT. Mm. Uh, so uh, it took about 16 individual sessions. But on the basis of that, um, she started to, she had developed enough confidence uh, that maybe she didn't have a horrible smell, which was her her, her central delusion, mm. uh, that she could then begin uh, exploring psychodynamic explanations for it. Mm. And the turning point in the CBT treatment came uh, in um, after session seven, uh, where she took a, a trip for the first time in 20 years. She got on a plane to visit uh, a cousin. Uh -huh. And while she was at the cousin's house, uh, she heard voices through the wall saying that she smelled like fish. Mm. Uh, and 
we had made enough progress in the therapy that it didn't make sense to her that these people in the neighborhood that she thought that were whispering to her through the wall would have flown mm. down there to this other state and hid in her cousin's house for a week. It didn't make any sense to her. Mm. So that was a real turning point where she could say, I know it must be me. It can't be that they did that. It must mm. be me, but it's so real. It's so real. And there's a, something in the, um, the phenomenology literature of psychosis called double bookkeeping okay. where the person uh, feels the delusion to be true, uh -huh. but intellectually they know it to not be true. Mm. And uh, the person is in both states of mind at the same time. Uh -huh. So she passed through a period where uh, she felt the delusion to still be true, but she intellectually understood that it can't be true. And, uh, she made very good progress, uh, went back to work, established her life outside. Uh, she had uh, a significant relapse, though, um, mm -hmm. some years after that. So the psychotherapy was not a permanent cure for her. Mm -hmm. uh, there were conditions in her life that changed uh, where there was a recurrence of her fears about uh, having a bad smell. Mm -hmm. And as I was saying before, uh, one of the things that people can learn in psychotherapy is that is that they have different ways, kind of multimedia productions of experiencing their self-doubts. Mm. So with Ariel, her multimedia production was more olfactory. Okay. That's how her uh, negative sense of herself came to her. The patient I was telling you before, uh, who hears criticisms through the walls, it was more just auditory, the mm. chatter of the neighbors uh -huh. uh, about him. Uh, and that's the way he experiences his self-doubts. Uh -huh. um, so uh, she was a uh, courageous, uh, smart, determined person uh, who really, um, uh, I, I think the, the antidepressant she was on may have kept her from attempting suicide. And also mm -hmm. she uh, uh, has a very loving attachment to her children, which was another great deterrent. Hmm. But I think without psychotherapy, uh, I, I don't see her as having made any recovery. And uh, there are uh, hundreds of thousands of people like this, you know, in public clinics uh, who really could do much better than they're currently doing if hmm. they had substantial psychotherapy. That, that leads me kind of into, so my wife um and she's at her a practica site right now so she's out in the community um our third year of school and she's working at a psychiatric hospital but it's um kind of short stay um she only sees people maybe anywhere from two to six sessions and sometimes she gets people who are either delus delusional or have hallucinations um for, some, for her, for someone working in her position where you have two to six sessions with someone, but you, you do have the opportunity to meet with someone for, let's say, an hour a day, three days a week, um, what would your kind of recommendation be for them on, on how to best go about helping someone, helping a psychotic patient in that situation? Of course, um it will depend a great deal on uh, the particular patient. But uh -huh. um, one thing that you can accomplish in a short period of time uh, is to convey to a person suffering from psychosis uh, that um, you are making an effort to see them as a mm. human being, mm. uh, that you don't see them uh, just as a crazy person, as a, as a chronic mental case, mm -hmm. uh, but that you're making an earnest effort to understand them, uh, and that you believe that what they're saying isn't just crazy, meaningless stuff, mm. but that it's information. It's an attempt to communicate. And uh, this is something that you can communicate to a person in a single session. Mm. Uh, will that, uh, you know, uh, cure the psychosis? Probably not. Uh, but uh, that is uh, a, a kind of life-giving mm. uh, experience for people. Uh -huh. And in uh, the psychiatric literature, there are occasional reports of patients rep uh, recording the, the very single conversation that they had with a staff member. Uh, and uh, there, was, uh, there was one patient uh, who recalled a particular nurse 
who talked to them and she said, you talk to me uh, like I was a real person. Mm. Uh, and those things don't go forgotten. So mm. there's a lot you can do okay. in however, even in one session. Yeah. There are other things you can do. Uh, there's short-term uh, CBT interventions. Uh, we had a man in the hospital who thought that the uh, staff and his medication was poisoning him. Mm. I asked him on rounds. Uh, so if you were poisoned, how would you know? He said, vomiting, bleeding, fainting. The next day when we were making rounds, I asked him respectfully, uh, any vomiting? No. Any bleeding? No. How many times did you faint? I didn't faint. Uh, did that cure him? No. But it made him a little more comfortable and a little less worried that he was uh -huh. actually being poisoned you know, by mm. the uh, staff. Mm. And sometimes, depending on the patient, again, you can make very dramatic gains uh, in a short period of time, uh, turning a corner quickly with the patient. Um, one of the uh, patients, which I, I think you were referring to, to with another book chapter, a woman who I was hearing voices saying that uh, someone was going to die. Mm. And the patient thought that it was her responsibility to figure out who this was and warn them. Uh, in four sessions, uh, she developed enough distance about her voice hearing experience uh, that she wasn't uh, uh, that concerned about that part of it anymore. Mm. That, she, that she had to warn uh, people. Uh, so um, in four you, sessions. You, you, yeah, the, wow. depending upon the patient, you yeah. can sometimes uh, do some very substantial work in a short period of time. Yeah. Usually it takes longer. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. And those four sessions, that was primarily CBT kind of, um, you, you're hearing these voices. What is it that you would say allowed her to gain distance from not being so concerned with what the voices were saying? Um, we, uh, in her case, uh -huh. uh, a lot of the things that was helpful to her was what we call normalizing okay. psychotic experience. So, uh, I essentially, uh, showed her how all human beings have an internal dialogue. Mm. We talk to ourselves, mm. uh, and, uh, that the voice hearing experience in psychosis is just one example of a general phenomena that people have. So, for example, uh, I occasionally hear my voice, my name called out loud on the street. That's a hallucination of everyday life. Uh, mm -hmm. Parents of uh, very young children uh, who put the child to bed at night, they may be alert to the child crying. They may hear the child crying, but the child isn't crying. Mm -hmm. They hallucinate uh, the child crying. So um, this connection between the voice hearing experience and ordinary mental life uh, she understood it quickly, uh, and it was, uh, I have a diagram in my book uh, where thoughts slip through a boundary into uh, the outside world, uh, and she really understood that diagram, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's what helped to turn the corner for her, uh -huh. and we eventually uh, uh, figured out who it was that was going to die. Okay. And you know who it was? Oh. Her. <laughs> oh, okay. Her. Uh -huh. It was a meditation on loss, death. She mm. lost her mother. She lost her father. Her dog was about to die. Mm. Uh, she was uh, in the generation where she knew that she was moving up. So she was. It was the shadow of mortality, mm. among other things, that was hovering over her that got played out in this psychotic theme. Mm. That's a psych psychodynamic part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you speak to? Let's say you have. A patient whose their main diagnosis is is major depression, um, and then they have the specifier with psychotic features. Um, can you speak to how you might? I know it's variable, but can you speak to maybe how you might treat them in a different way than you would a psychotic? Maybe someone who is suffering from psychosis but also is experiencing depression. Um. Psychiatric diagnosis can be uh, of some use in guiding pharmacology. Okay. So if the person had uh, clear what we call affective components, depression or mania, uh -huh. that might lead the prescribing psychiatrist to think about mood stabilizers like okay. Lamictal or lithium. Uh, but diagnosis isn't very helpful in understanding the psychology of the person. Hmm. So I don't rely on diagnosis that that much. It's okay. not a useful tool uh, to me. Uh -huh. And um, 
I, I'm more interested in uh, understanding uh, how does the person experience the source of their suffering. Hmm. And um, that's the way into the uh, psychology. So hmm. one, one could say, broadly speaking, uh, it's depressing to be psychotic. <laughs> You know, un unless you have a psychotic delusion of grandiosity, it's depressing. Uh -huh. the, the suicide rates and schizophrenia are very high. So um, it's it's not that the, the the person has schizophrenia in the way that you have uh, influenza or you mm. have some other kind of medical condition. No, uh, the psychosis is an expression of the authenticity of the person. Hmm. So in that way, uh, this the idea of medical labeling and diagnosis doesn't quite apply hmm. to this psychotherapy work. Okay, yeah, you. I I remember you wrote about you can often there. There's these charts for each for each patient, and you look through the chart, and it might have their diagnosis, it might have the medications that they're on, but you're hard pressed to find anything that's defining, you know, their maybe their traumatic history or how they perceive their own psychology or how they perceive their suffering. And you're hard pressed to find kind of a psychological case conceptualization or formulation of the patient. And so each time a new person goes in to see them, it's you're starting over again and you have no conceptualization. That's right. That's, um, that's a very typical practice because mm. you can summarize uh, the person's medication pretty quickly and efficiently. Uh, it takes much more time to give a thoughtful case summary hmm. uh, of what was accomplished and not accomplished in the psychotherapy. So most most discharge summaries have almost no useful psychological information in them, uh, but pretty good biological information about you know what medicines the person was on. Yeah. Um, one of my questions was, I guess you you've been in this in this field for a long time you've you've worked um in these in this setting you have a lot of experience you're writing about it um can you speak to what would you advise needs to happen in order for the ambitious psychotherapy you are advocating for be implemented in these different sectors that you're working within um i think for the the last hundred years there there have been uh, clinicians in every uh, generation, you know, that, that have had an interest in uh, psychotherapy for psychosis. So, uh, at the minimum, I think um, I hope to be a person uh, who helps to keep these ideas alive mm. uh, for um, the next generation of clinicians mm -hmm. like you. Uh -huh. Yes, and other people coming into the business, so that you don't have to rediscover all of this. Mm. So, so that. This is something that uh, lots of people have been thinking about, you know, for a hundred years. Mm. Uh, what the political and financial uh, moment is going to be uh, that uh, will gain some more traction for this, um, it's hard to predict. So mm. I think that um, the model I would have about it is uh, triage. So okay. it's kind of a grim model, but um, in the battlefield, uh, triage is clear so that uh, the battlefield surgeon who's walking through makes a decision of who they can't help mm. but who they're going to invest time in. So I think uh, clinics and uh, clinicians should have a kind of triage mentality mm. uh, and while it's best to try with everybody uh, to try to pick patients where uh, there appears to be an opportunity uh, for um, uh, they're a good candidate for psychotherapy uh, and then to really uh, devote an ambitious effort, you know, to helping them. Hmm. So what would that look like in the clinic? Uh, I think uh, in the United States, most clinics, uh, uh, frontline providers who are not in administrative positions, they have uh, anywhere from 80 to a hundred patients. Uh, how can you even remember people's names yeah. much less faces with these kinds of caseloads? Uh -huh. So you have to triage and uh, pick one or two patients in that uh, to work with, uh, you know, uh, once a week with ambitious psychotherapy uh, and uh, find a way to administratively uh, get the um, supervisors in the clinic to allow that to happen. 
mm. uh, to give people the chance to do that. So I think that that's something that is uh, currently achievable, but uh, our resources are uh, f- um, far too few for mm. you know, meeting this need as a public health measure. Okay. I wanted to read, I really liked this quote from your book. It says, the idea that chronically psychotic persons who have suffered terrible traumas need only correct a chemical imbalance with neuroleptics and be well, as one may correct the chemical imbalance of diabetes with insulin is a delusion. Um, I think it, in a lot of ways, it encapsulates a lot of what we've been talking about. I think it's very encouraging to, in some ways, um, like Ariel, for ex- for example, 10 years, a decade of your life spent on neuroleptics and then what was it? Nine months of psychotherapy with her? Yes. Yeah. Nine months. And then she did profoundly better. She, you said she had like the relapse, but, um, but ultimately she's in a better place because of it. And, um, you've, you've alluded to like CBT booster sessions. So you've talked yeah. about how beneficial therapy can be for these people. And it's, it's very encouraging to hear. Um, and when you, so this is kind of shifting gears very momentarily, but you were, um, you were talking of a psychotic experience and you, you wrote that quote, there may be a heightened perceptual awareness of the outside world where colors appear more vivid and sounds seem more intense. There may be an increased sense of meaning and communion with nature or an oceanic feeling of merging with the natural world, feelings that may not be, at least at first, entirely unpleasant. Uh, I read that, and I'm also at the same time I've been reading this book um, titled Young on Christianity. It's about Carl Jung and his, it's just kind of a compilation of his um, writings on Christianity. And within it, uh, Jung wrote, Um, about the individuation process and um, kind of the emerging of archetypal themes and patterns uh, through the individuation process. And so he said, self-constellating archetypes and the resultant situations steadily gain a numinosity, indeed are sometimes imbued with a positively eerie demonism and bring the danger of psychosis threateningly close. The upsurging of archetypal material is the stuff of which mental illnesses are made. In the individuation process, the ego is brought face to face with an unknown superior power, which is likely to cut the ground from under its feet and blow consciousness to bits. And I read that and I thought um, how kind of strikingly close it is to your quote about what someone who during their first and their initial psychotic break might feel and I was wondering if you can kind of speak to this and 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 how prevalent religious themes are within psychosis and if you think it has any type of parallel or connection or overlap. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, as you probably know, um, it's um, I think widely uh, considered that that Jung had a psychotic episode hmm. uh, and uh, his book, it's a fantastic uh, book, beautiful, uh, you know, painting plates. Uh, it's called The Red Book. Okay. Uh, is a kind of account of his psychosis. So um, there, there are advantages, uh, but I think also some disadvantages, you know, in, in being uh, immersed in the psychotic experience uh, mm. and, and then trying to think more generally about that. But um, I think that uh, I'm not a Jungian scholar. I'm not a Jungian uh, therapist. But um, oh. I, uh, the way I translate Jung into my way of working, for example, with the voices, uh, I think it's uh, very uh, uh, compatible to think of uh, the voices uh, kind of reappearing in the mind as kind of messages from the interior. Mm. And I think one of Jung's ideas is that... Um, uh, symptoms being visited by an archetype as a kind of message uh, that there's still some psychological work and growth that needs to be done mm. uh, with the person. And uh, so I think, I think that's a reasonable way mm. to think about the emergence of, uh, of psychotic symptoms. Yeah. And um, 
one of the reasons that I think religious themes are um, so common in psychosis is that one of the basic ideas of religion is that um, the, the everyday reality that we see uh, is only one level of reality, and there's a deeper meaning, there's a deeper uh, uh, significance mm. to experience. Uh -huh. And when that's translated into the psychotic state, uh, the person thinks that uh, the appearance of things is superficial, but they're getting messages mm. about what the uh, the true reality is underneath uh, the uh, source of things. And um, so that's a kind of uh, particular extension of the idea uh, that uh, the true reality is deeper than the super superficial appearance mm. of things. And also I think that uh, religion encapsulates uh, and tries to talk about some of the great themes that all human beings are concerned about, good and evil, mortality, what's a good life, uh, living with one's uh, community, all those things uh, have gotten uh, a treatment in religion. Another thing that happens in the psychotic experience is that uh, the psychotic experience has a, a revelatory quality to it. Uh -huh. And psychotic people will sometimes say, it was revealed to me, mm. I was shown, I mm. was led to believe, these kinds of statements. Uh -huh. So that kind of pop of uh, revelatory experience, uh, uh -huh. something that overlaps with uh, religious conversion experiences. Interesting. Uh, it's okay. a very complicated question, a very complicated yeah. relationship. Yeah. Good. Good job on answering it. <laughs> um, my last question for you. Um, with so much, you, you write in your book about so much burnout, about, um, you know, lack of funding, you see different waves and patterns of, of maybe, uh, an emergency situation that plays out. Maybe it gets a lot of attention in the media and then funding comes in for a little while. People get kind of, um, bonuses and then it eventually drops out. You get, you, you said you can have a caseload of 80 to a hundred patients for one for one doctor um and then people experience burnouts um there's maybe little you, you don't you don't see a lot of reward especially immediate um gains um and then and then either people move to a different job which leaves vacancies which you write about people they might get promoted they have a new job title maybe a little of an increase in salary but then they also, with that, have to take on extra responsibilities and see more patients. And within that environment, um, how is it that you have sustained energy and passion and, and maybe dealt with um, burnout your, in your own experience? Um, I've been uh, lucky in a certain regard because um, in addition to doing this kind of clinical work with uh, persons suffering psychosis, uh, I've always had uh, administrative roles, mm. uh, done administrative work, um, done uh, teaching and training, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, I say this, I hope with, with modesty, it's just uh, a relevant fact that as vice chairman of the department, uh, I have sufficient power in the hierarchy of the organization Mm -hmm. uh, to allocate my time, not entirely the way I would like, mm -hmm. uh, but I have a little more control over my time mm -hmm. than I think uh, more junior people uh, do. So it's a luxury. Uh, so I can spend time thinking, writing, treating patients like this in my discretionary time. If you're a new employee, <clears throat> uh, you know, working on the front lines with a caseload of uh, 80 you know, people, mm -hmm. you don't have the same degree of discretion and power. And um, I, uh, because, because each hospital, each situation is different, uh, the possibilities for uh, making gains in psychotherapy or psychosis may be different in each hospital. Uh, so for example, you mentioned that your uh, wife works in a, you know, kind of acute setting. Yeah. So questions I would want to be thinking about um, is there anybody sympathetic in the next level up in the organization to um, psychological treatments 
Uh, and could you get one hour of peer supervision for a group mm. of clinicians that are interested in that, that is in effect sponsored by this person one step up in the power hierarchy? Uh -huh. uh, that would be a practical step. Now, who is that person? Uh, there's some settings where there isn't anybody like that. Mm. There, there may be even a psychiatrist who is uh, opposed to psychotherapy. Mm. Uh, but uh, there might easily be somebody you know, who said, well, yeah, no, actually, I believe that myself, uh, but I haven't really had it. Yeah, okay, let's do it. Let's yeah. do it. Get a group. So everybody has to be resourceful at their local level. Mm. Uh, try to uh, get as much going as you, you know, as you can. There's also some organizations, uh, the uh, uh, ISPS, the International Society for Psychological Treatments of Schizophrenia, which is a good organization to belong to. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, there are a variety of trainings that are available. Um, and, uh, uh, I do some trainings through my psychoanalytic institute, uh, and, and there are other. There are national uh, trainings available for CBT for psychosis. So there are places that people can get, you know, additional training at this point. Hmm. Reading books, you read my book, yeah. and so forth. So yeah. um, small local, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like they say, with organic produce, locally grown. <laughs> I think uh, it's not going to come from Washington, D.C. It's got to be yeah. locally grown. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, what is the, you mentioned you're working on a second book. What is that? What is that second book going to be? Uh, the second book is um, probably will be a little controversial hmm. uh, among some proponents of psychotherapy for psychosis because um, the book is about making uh, simultaneous CBT and psychodynamic formulations mm. uh, early in treatment. Uh, and I think there are some psychodynamic clinicians who have a feeling you have to wait, you, you shouldn't jump to any conclusions, mm. keep it slow. Uh, in my experience, sometimes, uh, like in the dog example, uh -huh. uh, I, I knew within 10 minutes that... Uh -huh. <laughs> this guy had terrible self-esteem. Uh -huh. I knew why. Uh, and I knew what the center of the CBT formulation was, the dog. <laughs> so the patient had already done all of the preliminary organizing work. Yeah. So what the book is about is uh, trying to get an initial uh, formulation and map that includes a CBT approach, mm. how much you approach this from CBT, and what's the dynamic issue that's being played out in the psychotic symptom fairly early in treatment mm. uh, to guide the clinician and uh, be a kind of map of how things might go. So yeah. that's what sounds good. I look forward to it. What do you have an anticipated publishing date? No. Okay. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, no pressure. I've got 20 cases, you know, yeah. written up and uh, I'm, looking for uh, at least 30 so it's okay it's in the works yeah it's in the work yeah. yeah well dr garrett this has been very very informative uh it's been encouraging and i i really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me i appreciate what you're doing and i admire your work so thank you very much thank you for uh, the interview and uh, thank you for your interest yeah.